Welcome back to Ignite on the Gold Coast, the late afternoon break between sessions. And I'm joined for the first time today by Dr. Neil Rudin. Neil, it's great to see you. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Good to be here. Lots of people will know you, but for those who don't, tell us a bit about yourself, uh, where you fit into the whole ecosystem, perhaps? Yeah, sure. So I've been working on and off with Microsoft Technologies for a very long time. Should we say beard. that? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I was uh, playing around with Microsoft Technologies in kind of Windows 1, Windows 2 days and got involved in uh, supporting Microsoft with, you know, building out some early products that people may have heard of like Visual C++ um, and bounced in and out of Redmond working with different teams ever since and uh, always tried to play with what I think is cool stuff. And that's, that's one of the things I've always uh, found about you is that cool stuff is, is almost your trademark. And so whatever's cool this week is, is, uh, is something you're, uh, you're concentrating pretty hard on. You're yeah. uh, a Microsoft Regional Director? I what am. What does that mean? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> what does it mean? It's a great question. Um, so Regional Directors, there's I guess about 150 of us worldwide. Um, and I guess the majority of Regional Directors are tied to a region. So like a Regional Director for Australia. Right. Uh, and what it means is that you're a high level influencer. So you have the ability to go and talk to um, people within organizations, uh, usually C-level or director level, exec level, about technology. Uh, you have a broad understanding of the technology as well as a deep understanding, usually in multiple areas of technology, uh, in, in the Microsoft stack, obviously, within the Microsoft right. ecosystem. Um, and so the regional director program has kind of grown over the last, I guess, 20 years into uh, what it is now. Um, where we also have global regional directors, which you kind of think global and region doesn't necessarily make sense, but anyway, the name is what it is. Um, and we work with, so I'm a global regional director, and we work with Redmond on um, how do we scale out some of the bigger uh, conversations that we want to have with developers into community? Uh, how do we evangelize and uh, integrate the stories that we're telling with um, some, some of the new technologies that are coming um, and there, there's various programs that this fits into out of um, developer experience team, the DX team that you work for yeah, yeah. here in Australia. I, I, guess, I guess the two things that I think about with regional directors, the first one is you guys are generally very knowledgeable about not just the Microsoft stack but the entire technology ecosystem That's true. In, a, in a particular area. And yeah. So if you were to go in and talk to say the CIO of a big bank, you would be able to have a, a very sensible and reasonable discussion, not just about the, the, the specific Microsoft stuff that we might want you to talk about, but more generally about where that fits in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the biggest picture, which yes. is great. Yeah. The other thing that I think that, uh, that people might not know about regional directors is how much influence you have over some quite high level people at the company. And so yeah. there's, a, there's a, a, a regional director alias that, uh, that, that all the RDs are on and some of the Microsoft people are allowed to, to lurk on, on which people like Scott Guthrie and, uh, and Satya Nadella Such are, is on that are, list, are yeah. common contributors, and, and, and which, which means that they've got this, this immediate feedback loop to mm -hmm. a bunch of people who are sort of outside the company, I think a really valuable resource. Yeah, I'd say one of the, the traits of a regional director tends to be that we already have connections deep into various groups within Redmond. So we're already working with product groups where people, the, the regional director group has a, a high percentage of, of its members are people that have been working with Microsoft very closely for a number of years and already know a lot of the product group, uh, you know, PMs, owners of product, etc. Maybe even know a bunch of the developers in the dev team. We right. have, you know, side conversations back and forth about issues that we found or how customers are engaging with the products and things we would like to see that would improve the ability for that product to support their needs. And so those, those kind of conversations between us and customers and then us acting as an interface back into Redmond, into the product groups, um, makes us, I guess, quite a unique group of people. The other thing I love about it is it's a fairly international group of people. It's very international. Which is yeah. uh, perhaps a little bit unusual with, with the, the Redmond sort of focus on, on things being mainly local. Mainly US. Mainly US perhaps. And, which and I think maybe, a, mainly Seattle. Mainly, mainly <laughs> Seattle, though they call it the Redmond reality bubble. Right? Yes. But, but you guys help bust that bubble quite nicely. I really yeah, like that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think, you know, the MVP is also a very international group and they're providing a different level of feedback um, in terms of they tend to be very deep into one or two specific right. technology areas. 
Um, and maybe more techie focused than business focused generally. Yep, yep, I think that's true. Um, Lots of you RDs are also MVPs, but there's true. no necessity for that no, crossover to happen. No, no. Yeah, that's very there cool. are RDs that are not MVPs, right. and there are plenty of MVPs that are not, not RDs. RDs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what is it that you're passionate about at the moment? What's, what's uh, floating your boat? Uh, I, I'm excited about new ways that we engage with computers and that's not really at the moment i always have always been. That, sure right? so i mean you know i worked on one of the original smartphone projects i worked on the original tablet pc project uh, you know in redmond in 2002. Um, i've always been interested in in ways that we break the the mechanism of engaging away from a keyboard and mouse so like touch and then ink and stylus uh, were interesting to me, and, and now that you kind of we're at this next wave, I think of uh, capability. Like we've had, it's not like speech is a new thing. Uh, you know, I remember playing around with speech for Windows in Windows 95, and we could talk to our computers. In fact, pen isn't a new thing either, right? right. We had pen for Windows 3.1. We had tablet PC in 2002. But we're getting these new mechanisms to have conversations with our computers, with our software that are enabling us to, to, to engage with technology in maybe a more natural way. In a way that, you know, like typically if you think about how we as geeks or nerds engage with technology, we know all the command line utilities and we type all these weird commands and things come up in black boxes in green text, right? And, and then, you know, over the years that evolved into, win, you know, into a windowing type interface right. with panels and windows and you can move things around. And you get this kind of discoverability where, oh, I wonder what this can do. Let's hover over a menu and it shows you things. And so you can kind of explore what it can do, but you still have to learn how to use the software and, it, and you have to do it on its terms. It provides right. the menu in its terms. So you want to find the ordering menu, you find it and you look and you see what's available. And then you go down the menu, go, oh, I, you know, I want to order from the lunch menu. And you, you scroll down to the next thing. And, and if so you get on. the arcane incantation slightly wrong, then nothing works or right. even worse, something breaks. Yeah, and, and then you know the whole thing blows up. Right. Um, which we get less and less of now, which is fantastic. <laughs> but, but you know, it still happens. And, and so we've gone from these exploratory interfaces, which are GUIs essentially. Um, so you know, command line was you know it or you don't know it. Right. Go and read the manual. Yeah. GUI was exploratory. Uh, and, and the next wave, which I guess is very, has various names, one of those has been NUI, natural user interfaces, next level user interfaces. Um, involves a whole bunch of more natural ways of engaging with technology. And, and so, you know, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Star Trek. Why can't I just talk to my computer? Right. right? And, and how, how do I talk to my computer? Well, that depends on the modality that I'm in and, and depends in the, in the context. So, you know, Bill Buxton has this saying, everything is, you know, great for one thing and bad for something else. Right. Or worse at something else. And, and um, you know, you think about like speech as an interface. Speech is a great interface in a car. I don't really want to be like typing on a keyboard while I'm driving. So I want to say, hey, you know, call so and so, make a call. Um, speech is, but if I'm sitting in an airplane surrounded by passengers, I don't want to be doing bank transactions by speech. Right. Oh, yes, and my password is, yeah. and my bank balance is, and I owe this much money to the sure. bank, right? And that's not a, so you then you want a nice tiny little s small screen that only I can see that's private. And, and so you need to think about the context of the interface. Um, but yeah, we're now getting to a point where having conversations with our computers is becoming much richer and we can do it in a language that we know. That we know. So I can speak to my computer in English. Um, I, I apparently speak English. Yeah. And, and you know, then you can have this conversation and it doesn't have to be verbal. I could be texting my sure. computer, but I can do it in a way that's that's natural to me so, and on a channel that I want to do it on. So what are some of the things that, um, that, that we need to think about if we're have starting to have conversations with a computer rather than giving it commands? Yeah, so I think you need to think about like how we have conversations. We have a dialogue with each other and we have a conversation and, and we can build a, a set of contexts to that conversation and that's what you need to start thinking about. So firstly, you need to understand the, the intent of the conversation or the request that's being made. Um, and you know, Microsoft has Lewis, which is part of the uh, cognitive services, the language understanding uh, intelligence service. And, and that gives us the ability to take natural language 
and determine intents out of it. Right. And then you push that intent into a dialogue or a piece of a conversation and maintain that as a context within the conversation. Um, now, you know, technologies like the bot framework enable that to be done in a much more simple way for us as programmers. So right. as a, you know, at a technical level, I can take something like the bot framework and I can start building these conversations. And essentially a conversation is really just a flow of text back and forth between, you know, two endpoints. In this case, the two endpoints happen to be humans, sure. but you know, it could be a computer at the other end. And what you want is the response to feel human too. Yep. Um, and, and so one of the things you can do is start to do things like detect emotion uh, and actually provide emotion back as well. And that's interesting. Like, what, you know, Why should my computer not be angry at me <laughs> for, for doing something wrong, right? And, and why should my computer not be happy at me for doing something right? That would be cool. And you start to get that feedback loop happening. So trying to create these more natural mechanisms of engagement is something I'm incredibly passionate about right now. And, and you pulling together a set of the tools like Cortana, Cognitive Services, the bot framework to build out these scenarios, I think is really interesting. And this is exactly what your two sessions here at Ignite are so, about this, yeah, uh, this, this week. Yeah. Conversation as a platform is, is what we're kind of bundling it into. Right, and you can catch both of those, of course, on the, uh, the post-event recordings yep. Uh, yep. from Channel 9. There's another thing you're doing here that I was really keen that we, we talked about. And we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I wanted to make sure, sure we didn't miss it. But uh, you may have noticed that our Channel 9 guy here is sitting on a, uh, Channel 9. On, on a, on a thing that rotates, whoa, whoa. Uh, which happens to be one of the new Surface dials. Correct. Yeah. So this is the, the Surface dial. And uh, you know, I pick it up with my right hand because I'm left-handed. This is a non-dominant hand tool. Yep. Um, and so you know, this is, if you think about like, how we naturally engage with a screen in front of us, and especially if you're in kind of writing mode with a stylus, it's very useful. Maybe you have a mouse, maybe you have a keyboard, I don't know. But your non-dominant hand can then be doing other things. And so you could be bringing up menus, you could be exploring through interfaces, and I could be writing and bringing up a menu, doing things. And of course, this then t we take this to the next level on the studio product, where we can actually put the dial onto the screen, and it brings up a menu around it. Uh, and we can customize that menu, we can change that menu, and, and I'm doing a session to show developers how to take advantage of utilizing Dial as an independent device, plugged into, you know, it's a Bluetooth device, it can go into any Windows 10 machine, and then how do you then extend that and really, you know, make it light up into a beautiful experience when I put it down on the screen and create an interface around the dial that I can navigate around using the dial itself. I think this is really exciting because it, it is a, it's, it's a new way of interacting with, with computers that, well, it, it's, it's another way of interacting with computers. It's another way, yeah, I mean, with, nothing's that, new. That's right, we've had dials for a while. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's true. But, but it is a way that, that especially that's been commoditized yeah. in, in a way that now lots and lots of people use. And, and a few, there's a couple of, uh, I think, really exciting apps already uh, showing Absolutely, how cool yeah. the guys at Staff had. For yeah, example, I've done some really beautiful. interesting work that's where you can use it. You can actually pick it up and, and use it as a stamp. Take, yes. take a copy of something, put it on somewhere else, which is a really, to me, a very intuitive gesture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. very cool. Right, thank you so much for dropping by. I wish we had more time to talk. Yeah, it's always, it's always we need so much to do fun. another one. If um, if people want to stalk you on the internet, what's the best way to uh, <laughs> to track Good you? Good luck. Um, yeah. I, I I'm an occasional Twitter user at D R N E I L Doctor Neil. Yep. Um, uh, I. I Occasional blogger as well at uh, I can't even remember what the it's probably like Dr Neil blog at blogspot.com or something <laughs> like that. We find it and put the link on the on the page. Um, yeah, but I'm I'm not I, I don't really get a lot of time to spend kind of on online on social anymore. Awesome. But yeah, Dr Neil, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Andrew. Coming right up up coming right up next is Charles Sterling with his dive into Power Apps, and after that uh, Seth will be back with the interviews. Catch you later. Awesome. <laughs>